We're going to look at Isaiah chapter 49. And you're thinking, why? What is Isaiah chapter 49? Well, we'll come to that momentarily. But so before we all do that, it's about being in exile. Exile. Exile meaning, according to Wikipedia Dictionary, God bless it, meaning being barred from one's native country. And being exiled can bring to mind various pressures that it can bring. You're not allowed to go somewhere where you really want to go to. You're living under foreign dictatorship. Knowing you're not in your home. And it's not your home by choice where you are living. I want you to get your heads around that if you can just for a moment. There might be some of you some of you here this morning who are actually here not by choice, not inside this church. Well, you may not be here by choice. You got the invite and you thought we better go. Um, and you might feel a little bit like in exile right now, thinking I could actually have been laid in bed. Thank you very much indeed. Anybody feeling like that? Oh, there's less giggling going on now. You might feel more like that 15 minutes from now. Yeah. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> By the way, for those of Carol is my greatest heckler. Welcome back from your holiday. Thank you. Lord, I told you to get the timing right. Delay the plane. Anyway, but just imagine for a moment the frustration. Can you get, uh, this is genuine imagination. Um, uh, you know, uh, imagination is evidence of the divine, as uh, Anselm said. You know, let's get your imagination, what it feels like to be in exile, to be a place where you want to go, but you can't. The frustration is beyond imagination literally yes yes you did that yeah oh I want to get in there and that that oh frustration the anger you must be feeling are you with me yes. wonderful the, the anguish you're constantly in turmoil you're not sleeping at night properly are you because you you know that you're in a place that you shouldn't be you don't want to be here you're being stopped from going back the injustice when things don't go your way, you're in exile. I'm sure comments must ring through people's ears like, it wouldn't be like this if we were back in our home. If you're in exile, especially here for the Jewish people, their identity was at stake. Who you are. I mean, how many of us really identify with from where we originally were born? I, I, I made that to Cole, that comment earlier on. Ah, St. Christopher's in Amwell. Let's have a word, mate, because that's where I was brought up, literally across the road. You know, it's all of half a mile down the road, and I'm not in exile from it last time I checked. But, you know, because I know somebody who's not from Hamwell. Do you know why? Because they go... We live in Hanwell. And that's not how you pronounce it. It's Hanwell. All right? Get it right. Yeah, don't go no, because that's how you say it. You go Hanwell. All right? You drop the H and you stick an A where an E should be. Done. But you're, where you're identified, where you come from, that's part of your identity when you're exiled. And the Jewish nation were, by this point, in exile for some time. Their beloved Jerusalem, their beloved Zion had been ransacked. They had been exiled. It was their own fault. Clearly, they sinned against God and God said, and you're out. But doesn't mean that your identity is not still wanting to return back. They had repented and they were desperate to go back. And they wanted, clearly, people that were far flung to come back to Jerusalem to return. Their beloved city of Jerusalem, which is their identity. So for me, Amwell is, you know, a place where I was brought up. I finished at Brentside High School. Anybody? Yeah, yeah, I know Jonathan. Yeah, I know there are some people. All right, anyway. But that is, that is part of the identity and no longer be able to return back to there. And Jerusalem was in tatters. Its city wall was ruined and city walls were a big thing. Big thing then. That was ruined. So they were exposed. The city had that sense of desolation. Their identity was gone. Now, take this image and think about it now in your own life, just for a minute. 
Sometimes we can feel like we are in exile in the situations that we are in. Our personal walls have been shattered. We feel exposed. Our lives are in tatters. Our workplace, which actually for some of us can be our identity, is not going exactly as it should be. Our workplace, which sometimes you might have enjoyed going to. Do you enjoy going to work? No, all right, keep your hands down. But sometimes it's a nice place of refuge, funny enough, because maybe home life is not too brilliant. Going to work can be a place of refuge. But now that is no longer a good place. We can feel in refuge. Or maybe your home at the moment has been struck by a big illness. That no longer is a refuge and you can feel like exile there. It doesn't feel comfortable, the frustration, the anger, the anguish that goes on. Our walls have been broken down. It can also feel like you're not at home. I like Philippians 3, 20 to 21, when it talks about those who are followers of Jesus Christ. We are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. We are eagerly waiting for him to return as the saviour. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. We who are followers of Jesus Christ, are not citizens here, are we? I should be saying, really, not I'm a citizen of Anwell, but I'm a citizen of Evan. Still drop the H. It's all right. I just want to keep that verse in mind. The citizens of Jerusalem had lost all hope of restoration to the land, and therefore their identity. And maybe that's where you're at right now. You have lost any sense of things being okay again. So I'm now going to read Isaiah 49. We haven't got massively long on it. You'll be pleased to know maybe or not. But are you with me? Yes. Okay, if you've got a phone, turn to it. If you've got a Bible, turn to it. Sorry, normally it goes up on the laptop. But uh, that's me. Just going to read from verse uh, 8 for now. This is what the law says. Lord says, at just the right time, I will respond to you. On the day of salvation, I will help you. I will protect you and give you to the people as my covenant with them. Now, just a quick moment. The Lord is actually talking to, let's just say for now, Isaiah, just for a moment, just to make life easy. I'm not going to go into long explanation about who we think Isaiah was or if there was more than one Isaiah. I'm not going into all of that. But he's initially talking to a servant of the Lord saying, at the right time, I will respond to you. And then we also do know that at some point we transfer these verses to Jesus Christ because he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. But just for a moment, even here, this prophet is recognising where is Lord going to restore us? When are things going to return back? And the Lord says, at the right time... I will respond to you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm in the midst of trouble, when things are not going exactly according to plan, I'm going, God, where are you? Why are you not responding? Amen? Yeah. Am I the only one who feels like that? Why haven't you answered this now? Come on, sort this problem out today. I know it only started this morning, but could you sort it by this afternoon? Because if I went into a shop and I wanted to buy something, I'd just hand over my credit card, whether I could afford it or not. It's irrelevant. It's done and dusted, isn't it? And that's how we feel about the Lord, yes? When we're in problems, sort it now. Anybody with me? Okay. And Lord says, no, I will respond to you at the right time. It's almost like buying something. When you, need to, when you do buy something, if you can just hand the credit card over doesn't feel quite real, does it? It does when the bill comes a month later. Yeah? 
And then you suddenly realise, whoops, I haven't got the money to pay it off. Whoops, is that going to be the interest charge? Ouch. With God, when we're going through problems, I believe there are times he says, you need to learn something here. You almost need to save the money. So actually, when I come at the right time, once it's done and dealt with, there is no sting that is going to come afterwards. Are you with me? There's no interest later. I, the Lord, have dealt with it at the right time. So if you're feeling like that this morning, I think the Lord is saying to you, I will respond at the right time. Let's carry on with this Isaiah. I will say to the prisoners, come out in freedom and to those in darkness, come into the light. They will be my sheep grazing in green pastures and on hills that were previously bare. They will neither hunger nor thirst. The searing sun will not teach to them anymore. For the Lord in his mercy will lead them. He will lead them beside cool waters. And I will make my mountains into level paths for them. The highways will be raised above the valleys. See, my people will return from far away, from lands to the north and to the west, and as far from south as Egypt. I like that. The Lord, he will lead them beside cool waters. That entire set of verses, the minute I read those, reminded me of somewhere else in the Bible. One that most of us will probably know really, 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 really well. And it is Psalm... Thank you. Very well done, Mel. I'm glad you're here. Psalm 23. We love that psalm. And actually the Lord, when he responds at the right time and we wait, he will lead us. Not we lead ourselves and then say to God, oh God, could you catch up with me? Come on, how many people do that? I want to rush there. I want to get to the cool waters quick. Lord, come, what? Come, come on. Why is it not happening? And the Lord's saying, well, because I'm back here at the moment still. You better come back here and join me because you're not ready to be led to the cool, quiet waters. The Lord is our shepherd. Amen. Amen. And he wants to lead us to these cool, quiet waters at times. He wants to lead us through these situations. But a shepherd knows the best route. Who's got sat nav? Or use your Google thing on your phone. Yeah? When you want to find an address, who's got one? No? It's hard any hands going up. Josh, stick your hands up, man. I know you have. Come on. Okay? We've all got them. And we tap it in. Now, how many after a while go, nah, I know a better route. I know a shortcut. <laughs> who, who, does, who does that? Yeah? Okay. Notice I'm putting my hands up because I'm admitting to it. Okay? D? <laughs> don't, don't, don't give it that. Stick your hands up. Thank you. Okay, so we do that. But do you know what I love about the Google thing? Is it knows the best route sometimes because it knows about the traffic jam that is ahead that you don't know about. So it knows how you to take you there the quickest route you need to go because it's live and it knows about the traffic jam, yeah? Well, do you know, when God, when we're going through trouble and we want to be restored to a situation, God's saying the reason it's going to take some time and I'm going to take this route for a while is because I know about an obstacle you know nothing about. And I need to get you through it. And I need to get you circumnavigate it. You go your way, you're going to go bang up against another obstacle. And it is going to take a heck of a lot longer than you realise. And God is saying, I know the route to take you to call beside waters. So I will respond at the right time. So therefore then, in verse 13, it says, Sing for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth, burst into song, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and he will have, and he, sorry, and will have compassion on them in their suffering. Now that seems odd. They're not restored yet. 
Yet it's saying, worship the Lord now. Burst into song. In the light of the promise that God has given, burst into song. In light, it won't have happened yet, but worship the Lord in light of the fact that you know it will happen because he has promised to restore. He has promised to redeem the situation. He has promised to resolve it. Amen? Amen. And we don't do that. I don't do that. I'm sure a lot of us don't. The minute a problem comes, we're off going frantically trying to figure it out for ourselves, for a starter. And we don't worship the Lord. We spend our time moaning at the Lord. Why is this happening to me? I got taught something 20 years ago by a Christian. He turned around to me, why shouldn't it happen to me? Why shouldn't it happen to me? We live in a fallen, busted, broken world, don't we? So trouble's going to come. But we have to hang on to the promises of our God that he says, I'm going to be there. I will redeem situations. I'm with you. So worship him in the midst of them. Okay, quick t- story I wasn't going to tell. Many, many years ago before I was in ministry, uh, when I was a used car salesman, <laughs> sold lots of diesels, the government really loved me now. Um, uh, many years ago, uh, 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 my wife and I, when we were living in a flat, we, uh, we hadn't long had our daughter, and uh, we were living in a free, you know, a leasehold flat, you know. Flat was ours, but the property's leasehold. And as you all know, when they want to do external works, you, each flat suddenly gets a portion of the bill, don't they? And when they come, they hit you right between the eyeballs sometimes because you didn't expect it. Two and a half grand. Which wasn't a lot, really. In, this is in the <coughs> late 90, uh, early 2000s. Um, But the bill came through. We didn't have the money. We didn't have the money because Joy was now no longer working because we just had a child. And, you know, they've changed the rules now. You get a bit more money now when you're in paternity. So, you know, but, you know, but back then they didn't. Now, we could have done one or two things. Could have broken down in tears, distraught, go, oh, you know, why? What are we going to do? Frantically try and think about getting bank loans and whatever else, yeah? But for the first time ever in my life, and it was, and I'm being honest, we actually worshipped the Lord and said, he's going to sort this. A week later, he did. Uh, Long story short, unbeknownst to me, I've been working for this company by this point for 12, 13 years, something like that. Never been given a bonus in my life. You know the rest of the story. But it's not about me. It's about what God does, okay? And so sometimes he's in the midst of that, worshipped him, and went, you know, going to leave this with God. He knows our situation. Not like we've blown the money deliberately. This is the situation. He blessed us with a child. Somebody had to be the parent. Joy's much better at him than I am. (laughs) Let me go to work. So... So God does answer. We need to learn to worship the Lord in the midst of all our situations. And this is why, and this is the thing that gets to me. And yes, there is a bit about being a mother here. Verse verse 14 says, Yet Jerusalem says, the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. That's how it can feel, can it not? When there is the problem, that the, the Lord has deserted you. If you feel like that this morning, that the Lord has deserted you in the midst of an awful situation, if it feels like he's not around, listen to these next set of verses. Never can a mother forget her nursing child. Can she feel no love for the child she has born? But even if that were possible, I would not forget You, thus says the Lord. Doesn't say that in there, but I'm saying it. Let's be honest. Most mums can't forget their child. They have brought that child up in their womb for nine months. 
for most people, most mums, you've had the ability to be able to breastfeed your child. This is the imagery, by the way, that's here. The nursing child is God breastfeeding. Now, he's speaking to Jerusalem, but we can take this in individual concept as well. It's okay. And he is breastfeeding. There's an image for you of God, the father, as God, the mother. And actually, it's quite rude. In Psalm 91, it talks about him wanting to gather like, uh, 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 you know, a hen wants to gather her chicks. That's a mother image. Jesus, as we know, when he saw Jerusalem wept over, he said, how long I have wanted to gather you as a hen has gathered her chicks. He used Psalm 91. You never, as a mother, forget your child. Now, there are some, and it's quite real, that we are fallen human beings. There are some who have, unfortunately, abandoned their children. But God says, I am not like them. I can never abandon my child. I have nursed you. God has said, I have seen you. I have knitted you together in your mother's womb. Psalm 139. How can I forget you, says the Lord. How can I forget you? That is never going to happen. And this is it. See, I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Then he states, always in my mind is a picture of Jerusalem's walls in ruin. I have written your name on the palms of my hands. Not on the hands, but on the palms. Could you look at your palms for me? Assuming you all have some. Well, might be people who don't. Now, look on the back of your hands. Now, how many of you have got pen marks written on the back of notes you want to remember something by? Or who does it? Who writes on the back of their hand in pen? because they, they want to make sure they remember something. It's not there today, because what you've done is you wash yourself because you're coming to church for the, uh, the dedication service of Jai, yeah? But who does it? I don't personally. I haven't done it in a long time. Okay. Post-it notes were meant to be the new thing, but I even though some people actually stick post-it notes on the back of their hands now. I mean, really? But we do that so we don't forget something, do we? Or who ties a little knot? And puts, you know, people, there's some people used to put, tie strings around their fingers, didn't they? Or around your handkerchief. Yeah, tie a knot in your handkerchief, yeah. Before tissues. Before tissues, yeah, it doesn't work now anymore. Okay, but people do that, not to forget, yeah? Nobody ever writes it on the inside of their palm, really, do they? Normally because it gets sweaty and it burns off very quick, yeah? But God says, I have written your name on the palm of my hand. That denotes intimacy. That denotes him saying that every time I look at my hand... I see your name. Now, right, God doesn't have hands. He's spirit. But the imagery is there for us to understand that God is saying, how can I forget you? Your name is written on the palm of my hand. You use your hand for everything, don't you? God says, your name is written on the palm of his hand. That takes me to something else, and I think we need to get that for a minute. I don't know where you're at, but God has not forgotten you. Amen? Right at the beginning of this morning, Andy was talking about, you know, um, in Hebrews, that we are uh, got the right to come boldly forward to the throne of grace. Yeah? I I enjoyed the imagery because we're going to take communion in a moment. Uh, There's to give you hope. That means that soon I'm finishing talking. But uh, we're going to take communion in a moment and what it represents. And I I enjoyed the irony that while I was sat there, this entire row, this entire row here, at that point, was completely empty. Before the throne of grace, we can boldly come, not the front of church. Must always have one row between us and the front. I've always said this, if you, if you go to Baptist churches, you sit at the back. 
I remember when I went for ministry, they turned around to me and they said, Warren, you failed at the, la- at the last hurdle. I said, why is that? You sat right on the front row. You're truly not a Baptist. <laughs> Point being, we do tend to act like that with God. I'll take a step back. I won't quietly come forward. But God is saying, but your name is written in the palm of my hand. Come boldly forward. Bring your request to me. Talk to me in your tatters. Talk to me when you feel like your walls are exploded and you feel really blown open. I'm here because I am your loving father stroke mother. That's going to blow your mind to the concept, the idea of God as being mother. Come and see me later. It's scriptural. It's fine. But he's there saying, your name is written here. Look at the palms of your hand. Could you imagine God telling you, your name is written here? And then for me, taking it a step further, when Jesus had his palms nailed to the cross, he took on board all of your wrongdoing. (coughs) On the cross, the nails went through the palms of God's hands, where your names are written. What you decide to do about the reality of Jesus saying, I've taken it from you. I've taken every problem, every sin, every wrongdoing to give you eternal life. And for you to know that relationship with me, that's up to you. And if you know Jesus already and you are going through problems today and you've actually come here wanting Yes, to have fun, for there to be cheer and joy and laughter and worship of God. But underneath you're saying, but my life is really, really pants right now. God is saying, I will respond at the right time because your name is written on the palms of my hand. I have not forgotten. How can I? I love you. I'm there and I will respond at the right time. If that's you this morning, you have the opportunity to allow God to minister to you. You have the opportunity for you to respond to him. Because at the end of Isaiah 49, it states this. For I will fight those who fight you, and I will save your children. I will feed your enemies with their own flesh. They will be drunk with rivers of their own blood. All the world will know that I, the Lord, am your saviour and your redeemer. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I don't know where you're at. God does and you do. That's more important. But he's written your name in the palms of his hand. He hasn't forgotten. Take that on board. And you may not know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. You may not actually even think he even knows you. He does. Just because you don't know him doesn't mean he doesn't know you. And he's wanting that relationship with you. Let's close our eyes for a moment. Let's talk to God. Maybe God has spoken to you already. 
this morning. I want you to respond to that by talking to him now. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you. Um, just actually, Abba Daddy, just thank you that you love us so much that there is no way we can't go that you're not there. Thank you that our names are written in the palm of your hands. Lord, I want to pray for those especially this morning who are going through tough times, whose lives feel like they're in tatters. They are shattered. They are exhausted. Their walls have been blown open and they feel so exposed. Lord, I want to pray for them that your spirit right now will minister to them. They will know the peace of God in the name of Jesus. They will know your shalom in the name of Jesus. As it says, Lord, in Isaiah 40, thank you. Those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Lord, help us to hold on to that truth. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.